Okay, I think we will get started. So welcome uh, everybody uh, to the research seminar that's sponsored by the College of Public Health and Human Sciences here at Oregon State University. I'm Marie Harvey, I'm the Associate Dean for Research and I'm delighted that you're all joining the seminar today. This seminar is being sponsored or co-sponsored by the kinesiology program in our college. And to that end, I'm really pleased to introduce Sean Newsom, who is an assistant professor in the kinesiology program. And he has graciously agreed to introduce today's speaker and to moderate this session. And Sean will also provide a little few more instru instructions about the format seminar uh, for the webinar. So without further delay, I would like us to get started. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Newsom. And Sean, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Marie. Um, I also want to thank the College of Public Health and Human Sciences uh, for putting on this seminar. It's a great opportunity for us to introduce ourselves to Dr. Barry Brown. Before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, as Marie alluded to. Um, just to let everyone know you have been muted, I apologize. Uh, the way in which this is going to work is if you do have a question for Dr. Braun, uh, I'd like you to pop that into the chat. I'll be able to see those questions. And at the end of the seminar, um, I'll pick through all the great questions and feed those to Dr. Braun. So if you have those questions, just put them in the chat and they'll ultimately uh, get to our presenter in just a bit. Um, beyond that, I hope everyone is in for a treat. Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Barry Braun, who in many ways has been a mentor to me throughout my own research career. While I was a doctoral student, Barry was a, a su successful director of a laboratory at the University of Massachusetts Amherst that did a lot of the same work that I did in skeletal muscle metabolism. He's really a leader in our field. Uh, so that we understand the impact of things like exercise on skeletal muscle metabolism and including the interaction of some drugs that we commonly use to treat uh, disordered skeletal muscle metabolism, things like metformin and even SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, I'm not sure if he's going to tell you about some of that research today, but really a leader in the field uh, in that regard. A little bit about where, where Barry came from. Uh, I just learned moments ago that Barry is actually Born and raised in the Bronx. He's originally from the East Coast. I know Barry uh, from his time on the West Coast. He completed his PhD uh, with Dr. George Brooks. So some of you in the field may be familiar with that name. Really an icon and a legend, someone who quite literally wrote the book on exercise physiology. Uh, so Barry has a rich educational background, even beginning at the University of Pennsylvania in ecology and evolutionary biology, which explains a lot about the way Barry thinks. He's a very creative individual. Um, in his professional career, he's been remarkably successful, uh, authoring well over 100 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, and I know firsthand that Barry is an outstanding instructor and teacher. Barry doesn't know this, but one of my current doctoral students actually had Barry as a faculty member uh, back at University of Massachusetts Amherst way back in the day, and she continues to rave about how fantastic Barry's course was and Barry's teaching. Uh, with that, it's not surprising that he was named a distinguished uh, teacher, given the Distinguished Teaching Award at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, along the way, he's now made it to uh, becoming a professor and now the department head at the uh, Health and Exercise Science Department at Colorado State University where he's been for, what is it now, seven years, Barry? It's just about. So I'm excited for, for Barry to tell you about uh, uh, what he's been doing and talk about whether or not exercise is medicine and the importance of context. So with that, take it away, Dr. Braun. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I try to share my screen. Um, I will say thank you for that introduction and uh, great to see you. Uh, I am going to briefly mention some of uh, Sean's work when he was a doctoral student um, because it directly showed that something that we had uh, done in a few years earlier was actually wrong. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I always appreciate that. Um, slides look okay? Okay, good. Um, so uh, I was going to, this title, which I've used before, um, is not necessarily meant to just tick off everybody um, who thinks that exercise is medicine. 
Um, it's really just a, a question that I have myself um, in terms of if we're going to say that exercise is medicine, what does that mean? And do we really know what we're talking about? And if not, what do we need to know so that we do know what we're talking about? Um, so let me um, start with baseball because um, it is uh, baseball season. So I knew, I knew this wasn't gonna work as well as it did five minutes ago. Hang on, no, all right. There we go. Um, first, I have to make some disclosures. Um, I've always believed in full disclosure. Um, I am biased in numerous ways. I'm wrong on a regular basis. Given new data, I may change my mind. I do believe that climate change is real. Um, and the one I'm supposed to disclose, I have recent research partnerships with Pfizer Pharmaceutical and Medtronic device companies. Um, a lot of people have uh, done a lot of the work here, and rather than wait to the end, I wanted to uh, call them out now. And the, um, the students listed in green are the ones whose work I'm going to talk about uh, specifically today. Um, but, you know, the usual thing that, you know, without in, amazing students and uh, collaborators, none of this, you know, could possibly happen. So George Will, who some of you know um, as a conservative uh, writer, uh, wrote a story a few years ago about uh, the most important perfect game ever pitched, which those of you uh, who are of my vintage might remember. I'm not quite this old, but pretty darn close. Um, 1956, uh, Don Larson pitched a perfect game in the World Series, game six. Uh, what people may not remember is the last out was made by uh, Dale Mitchell. Uh, uh, the umpire, Babe Pinelli, um, called strike three on Mitchell. Uh, George Will wrote uh, famously that the pitch was a foot and a half, probably high and outside, but that Pinelli was so eager to get the game over, he called it a strike. And if you see the grainy video of that, um, it does look a bit high and outside, especially outside. Um, the great evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, who is also an enormous baseball fan, um, took issue with this. Um, at, uh, when he wrote an obituary when the umpire Babe Pinelli died a few years ago. Um, and he wrote that, yes, it's possible that the pitch was not a strike, but the batter must swing at a close pitch with so much on the line. Context matters. Truth is a circumstance, not a spot. And so with that, I really wanna talk about context and the importance of context in understanding um, exercise as medicine. So I'm not going to bore you with all the many ways that exercise as medicine has permeated the culture. Um, there are exercise as medicine programs in many, many countries. Uh, there are stories, there are, uh, you name it, there's a, uh, a, a big uh, body of exercise as medicine literature, as well as programs. And, you know, this caused me, like many, you know, of you, I am academic and therefore pedantic to try and understand what that really meant. If we say exercise is medicine, uh, what does that really mean? And if you, you know, go look at the definition of medicine in these standard um, uh, tomes, uh, there's the science and art of dealing with maintenance of health and prevention, alleviation, and cure of disease. Exercise clearly fits that definition. Something that affects well-being, no question exercise fits that definition. But it's the last one, a substance or preparation used in treating disease that I think many people refer to when they say exercise is medicine. And in particular, they're thinking of it as equivalent to, or in fact, maybe superior to pharmacologic agents. So here's the kind of information that we know or that we get when a physician prescribes a medication. Um, this one is for um, Ambien. And this is just part of the you know, 20 pages of instructions but there's an initial dose, uh, five milligrams for women, I'll get to that later, either five or 10 for men, taken once a night at, at a certain time, seven to eight hours remaining, uh, what you do if that isn't effective, um, warnings and precautions, the total dose should not exceed, it should be taken as a single dose. In other words, very specific instructions that are really specific to this medication and what it's meant to treat. Um, on the other hand, if you were to take the sum total of the physical activity guidelines for Americans, um, and I'm, that were recently updated in 2018, and I'm not dissing the, um, uh, the uh, folks who put it together, it was an enormous amount of work and a terrific piece of uh, uh, contribution, 
uh, to our knowledge of exercise and the maintenance of health, but really you could boil it down to a prescription that would look something like this. Um, a few pills is better than none, more pills are even better, take them on most days and try not to miss a lot of days in a row. So my contention has always been that um, we say exercise is medicine, but we are nowhere near as specific or precise or targeted um, as we think of in terms of pharmacologic um, medicine. And in particular, the pieces that seem to be missing uh, to me are what is the target? What's the mechanism? How does this actually work? Um, what does the dose response curve look like? Um, or what are the dose response curves look like? Um, what are the interactions with food? What are the interactions with other medications? Um, and then what are the potential side effects? So my goal uh, in this talk is to describe some of what we know, um, some of what we don't know, um, and then talk specifically about three pieces of context, interactions with energy balance, interactions with hormones, and interactions with other medications. And then finish with, I hope, uh, something that is, uh, if not definitive, um, at least asks more questions or better questions about whether exercise is actually medicine. So this is um, a study that was done 25, 35, 1986, whatever that is, uh, a long time ago um, by Dr. John Holisey. Uh, and it involved a group of men, all men, because this is before anybody knew that um, women were actually um, you know, part of the population and could be studied. Um, it hadn't been invented yet. Uh, and they went through a year long training program. Um, these are all men who had mild type two diabetes. Um, pretty rigorous training program. They lost a fair amount of weight along the way. And in the, um, in the pencil, um, uh, you can see their glucose concentrations on the y-axis and time on the x-axis in response to a glucose tolerance test. Um, you know, clearly in the diabetic range of fasting glucose around 150 and a peak of around uh, somewhere around 270 on average. Um, and then after this year of training, they're not even diabetic anymore. They have a fasting blood sugar of 100. Their peak blood sugar is about 150 or 160. So it's clear that exercise training um, with weight loss um, can not only ameliorate, but even reverse potentially um, type 2 diabetes, at least in the early stages. There are studies, which I won't show you, to show that the, the weight loss is not actually necessary. Uh, it's helpful, but that you know, training itself, even with vanishingly small amounts of weight loss, are still effective in making people more insulin sensitive, reducing their fasting and especially postprandial blood sugar, um, and potentially um, serving to prevent or even treat type 2 diabetes. Acutely, there's also an effect that each time somebody goes out and exercises, there is an effect um, on their insulin sensitivity um, in a positive way. And so this is a study by Doug King from uh, even a year earlier than that, uh, showing on the y, on the, uh, y axis, uh, the insulin area under the curve, the more insulin you secrete in response to a glucose tolerance test, the less insulin sensitive you are. So smaller numbers are better. Um, it requires less insulin to clear sugar from the blood. Uh, the open bar is before exercise. And then uh, after an exhaustive bout of exercise, uh, what this shows is one, three, five, and seven days um, after exercise, repeating the glucose tolerance test with no further exercise um, happening after that one initial bout between the open bar and day one. And what you can see is that um, one day after exercise, there is a considerable reduction um, in the insulin area under the curve, showing that people became more insulin sensitive. That persists even three days in, but does not persist five or seven days in. So we know a little bit about dose response that you know a single exhaustive bout of exercise um, confers some beneficial effects on metabolic health for at, at least three days, but certainly not five or seven days. And then uh, this study uh, by Corey Rinders um, a few years ago um, looked at whether the caloric expenditure was the key element of the exercise, or whether doing it at a low or high intensity really mattered. In this case, um, the caloric, um, or the energy expenditure was held constant. So at the moderate intensity, they did, a did it for a long time. At the high intensity, they did it for a shorter time. So that the total energy expenditure was matched. In this case, they're actually looking at um, glucose uptake 
um, in response to a given amount of insulin. So now higher numbers are better. Um, uh, so on the uh, y-axis is glucose uptake, uh, control condition, moderate intensity exercise, high intensity exercise, crossover design, same subjects. Um, and what you can see is exercise helps um, and it did not matter whether it was at a moderate or high intensity. Um, I'm gonna come back to this, um, but that's generally uh, been shown to be true. Although um, a lot of the sort of research on high intensity interval training in the last five to seven years um, would suggest that maybe this isn't as universally true um, as we thought in 2014. So I'm gonna show this uh, particular slide a lot um, as sort of an organizing principle. Um, and up in the upper left uh, is the old um, food pyramid, uh, the one I liked because it actually showed how physical activity was an important part of nutrition recommendations uh, that has disappeared in the last three incarnations of the, um, what's now the plate, not the pyramid. Um, that weight loss um, by itself has a beneficial effect on metabolic health. That exercise training with or without weight loss um, does the same. And then even acute exercise bouts um, have a beneficial effect so that each time you exercise, there's a tangible measurable benefit, um, which does not persist um, for more than a few days requiring reapplication of that exercise in the same way that you'd have to reapply um, a dose of pharmacological medication. And then on the right, you know, actual pharmacology and drugs that are used um, anti-diabetic drugs or other um, drugs um, that are used um, to have a beneficial effect on metabolic health. So uh, the interactions with, um, with energy intake, um, to me, this is a uh, serving of Oreos. Um, so here's a study uh, that was done in women with mild type two diabetes. Um, it was an inpatient study done at San Francisco General Hospital. Um, and the uh, women came in in three different conditions, a no exercise condition, a high intensity exercise condition, and a low intensity exercise condition, uh, similar to the study I just showed you by Corey Rinders, um, but shorter. Uh, or in this case, it was they did three bouts of exercise over the course of a couple of days. Um, and uh, in one case, high intensity for a shorter amount of time. In the other case, lower intensity for a longer amount of time total energy expenditure of about 750 calories over the course of those two days, which if you would like to put that into some other units, that would be the equivalent of walking or running seven and a half miles. And then this is a test where you infuse both glucose and insulin intravenously, uh, the insulin suppression test, so that uh, blood sugar plateaus um, after about 90 minutes, and the higher the plateau, the more resistant um, to insulin you are. So uh, low numbers are better. Uh, if you plateau at, you know, as you can see at 11 millimolar in the no exercise condition, that's not nearly as good as plateauing at about nine millimolar in both exercise conditions. And what I think is clear is again, uh, that exercise works, that exercise is beneficial, um, lowers that uh, plateau in blood glucose by about 25%. And it made no difference whether or not the exercise was done at a high intensity or a low intensity, as long as the caloric expenditure was equal. As I said, this was an inpatient study. So the, you know, the uh, dietitians in the metabolic condition provided all the food, weighed, measured, calculated to match their energy expenditure. But which energy expenditure? Um, as I said, they expended 750 more calories in the two exercise conditions than they did in the uh, no exercise condition. And the question for these um, investigators was, do you feed the calories back? In the exercise conditions, do you add 750 calories to their diet um, in order to account for that increased energy expenditure? And you could argue um, both ways, the advantages and disadvantages. But in this case, the investigators did not, partly because nobody else ever does that, and partly because reviewers, um, grant reviewers, hate the idea of feeding the calories back because they always say that the point is to create a caloric deficit. That's why you want to exercise. So here's a, um, but as some of you have already figured out, um, it creates a second variable, right? You have exercise, but you also have energy deficit. But there's a potential confounding variable here that you can't really separate because in, you have an energy deficit in the conditions that you also have exercise. And you'd think that these researchers would have known better 
um, since this was my PhD work uh, back at Berkeley uh, in 1995. And all I can say in my defense is uh, I knew that there was a problem and I was uh, convinced that at some point I'd be able to address this. Um, and that opportunity came along a few years later uh, when uh, Colonel Steve Black uh, came to do his PhD um, with me at the University of Massachusetts. And Steve was loved this question, this question of, is it the energy balance or is it the exercise? And so Steve found a group of uh, 16 men and women with um, insulin resistance. They did not have diabetes. They were sedentary, um, but not diabetic yet. Um, uh, stratified them into an energy deficit and energy balance group, um, put them on a weight maintenance diet for seven days, um, and then measured their insulin sensitivity or their insulin action using a technique we actually developed called the um, continuous infusion of glucose with stable isotope tracers, um, which allows you to measure both whole body glucose uptake and also specifically liver glucose uptake. And I won't get into the details there, we can certainly talk about them later if people want to. Um, then he had them do six days of exercise uh, in a row, uh, 500 calories every day, uh, not 490, not 510, 500 calories every day. Put them on the treadmill with the metabolic cart, counted calories until when they got to 500, they stopped. So six days of exercise, uh, two different groups. In one case, you feed the calories back, and in one case, you don't. Um, and then he did uh, repeated these tests of insulin action post-exercise. So just to give you a little uh, more background, we you know, used every method that we knew of to try and um, really make sure we were creating conditions with an energy deficit and an energy balance. Uh, those of you who do work like this know that um, in the deficit condition that you know, minus 481 plus or minus 24, that's a that's a good estimate, but it is not precise. Um, all I can say is we were somewhere in the ballpark of 500 calorie deficit we were hoping for, and the balance group plus eight, um, that's a, essentially zero. Um, so again, we were confident that we had created a condition where they were approximately in energy balance. But in free living people, there's just no way uh, to be as precise as that table makes it look. Um, and we fed those calories, and this becomes important, the entire diet and the extra 500 calories that the balance group got um, was composed of 55% carbohydrate, 20% protein, and 25% fat. Um, and no, um, the shaky writing there is not because I have um, some kind of early Parkinson's. Um, I did this on a plane and there was turbulence. So what we found surprised us. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you one piece of data among many. Um, on the uh, x-axis, the deficient group is in red, the balanced group is in black, um, and on the y-axis is glucose uptake um, using our stable isotope method uh, per unit of insulin. You know, so a pretty sophisticated measure of insulin sensitivity. Uh, pre six days of training on the left, post six days of training in that hatch bar on the right. So about a 25 to 30% increase. No surprise, this is what we always find. This is what everybody always finds. That's a pretty reliable, um, consistent um, change uh, in response to a few bouts of exercise. Surprised us is on the right, the balance group, um, that these six days of exercise appeared to have no effect at all um, on, these, uh, on these men and women if we fed the calories back. That replacing the calories appeared to completely abolish that 25 to 30% uh, increase in energy, uh, sorry, in uh, glu insulin sensitivity. And we have other pieces of data to show this as well. We have hepatic glucose production and you know, probably eight different pieces of data uh, or outcomes that all say about the same thing. But you know, as reviewers, we're happy to point out, again, there is a confounding variable here. Um, and that is um, sort of by definition, if you feed 500 more calories a day, you've got to feed them as something carbohydrate, protein, fat, you know, what do you do? Uh, and we decided that the most defensible, um, scientifically uh, or scientifically defensible way to do this was to keep the balance of calories the same. 55% carbohydrate, 20% carbohydrate, protein, 25% fat, um, and just give the 500 calories. Uh, then the question was when to give these 500 calories. And um, my thought was since we were trying to abolish an energy deficit, 
we should give them while the subjects were actually on the treadmill. Um, luckily, the grad students um, realized that was a stupid idea um, and convinced me that we should give it immediately post-exercise. Um, again, minimizing the time that the um, uh, participants spend in energy deficit. Um, that was in some ways a somewhat fateful decision. Um, but I think, again, scientifically defensible in that we were trying to look at energy deficit versus no energy deficit, and that's the best way to abolish any uh, contribution of energy deficit. And what reviewers were you know, pointed out is that you know, because we had kept the balance of calories the same, that in one case, they're getting about 330 grams of carbohydrate per day, and in the balance group, they're getting about 410, which is a pretty big difference. And if you go back in the literature, all the way back to 1989, uh, Greg Cartier had done a study in rats um, in which he had exercised them to exhaustion and then looked at um, how long their insulin sensitivity lasted after that exercise and shown that um, if you fast them, um, it lasts uh, for a long time. If you feed them uh, with carbohydrate, you abolish or minimize that increase in insulin sensitivity. But if you keep feeding them, but make it zero carbohydrate, um, that the insulin sensitivity persists. So the suggestion was, at least in rats, that it was the carbohydrate that was the culprit in terms of um, reversing the enhanced insulin sensitivity, not the calories. Um, and uh, then Dr. Newsom, um, in, his, uh, in his work uh, that was published in 2010, uh, showed this in humans as well, um, that in a condition when subjects were in energy balance uh, after exercise, uh, they had enhanced insulin sensitivity. If you fed them, uh, a low energy diet, um, but continued to feed them carbohydrate, um, then you also saw this slightly increased um, insulin sensitivity, but you got the best result um, when they were uh, fed the calories back, but in a low carbohydrate way. As you can see, the only significant change there um, is with that energy balance, but low carbohydrate condition. Um, I would point out that it's a vanishingly small difference that just happened to be significant, but still, um, I, I defer uh, to uh, a great piece of work uh, that was done by uh, Dr. Newsom. And then there was also the issue of the timing. You know, did it matter that we fed these calories back um, immediately after exercise? Um, and it probably did. And you know, we did some work to follow this up. Other people have done work to follow this up. Um, and we probably magnified the effect of the carbohydrate by giving it immediately after exercise, which is exactly what you want to do for athletes. Uh, to get them ready to uh, for their next bout of exercise, you know, restore glycogen as quickly as possible. You know, that's what you do. You give carbohydrate immediately post exercise, but it probably had the same effect or the uh, equivalent effect in these people of uh, restoring their glycogen and then um, diminishing that you know enhancement of insulin sensitivity we'd seen with exercise. So there does seem to be, um, uh, and we, I'll just give you another example from. Uh, Loretta DiPietro, uh, who did a study where she um, gave people meals either uh, before they had, or sorry, exercise in the morning, exercise in the evening, or timed their exercise to happen um, immediately after each meal and got the best effect on lowering blood sugar when exercise occurred uh, right after um, each meal. So we know that there's a, uh, an effect of timing and exercise, or, sorry, food and exercise in terms of you know, if you time them differently, you, you will get different results. So just to make this uh, what was a simple graphic more complicated, um, in addition to the things I mentioned before, um, that the timing of um, energy intake after exercise, and in particular, the quantity of carbohydrate and the timing of that carbohydrate all modulate, mediate, Sorry, epidemiologists, I always confuse modulate and mediate. I think in this case, it's modulate, makes the effect different. Yes, modulates the effect of exercise um, on metabolic health. Um, this, you know, as many of you know, uh, there was an increase or has been an increasing interest in the opposite of exercise, that is sedentary behavior or inactivity. Um, and this was something that uh, really got started uh, probably 15 years ago now and really became a hot area in our literature. Uh, and 
we heard a lot of talks um, from one person in particular about how um, inactivity and sedentary behavior uh, contributed in a profound way to um, impairment of metabolic health. And I never really bought it because it always seemed to me that there was a conflation of inactivity or sedentary behavior with positive energy balance or energy surplus. And I could never see anyone who'd shown that inactivity by itself was the culprit and not the accompanying energy surplus. So rather than continue to argue about it at every meeting, uh, Dr. Mark Hamilton uh, and I decided to team up um, and do a study in our lab uh, looking at did the energy or did an energy surplus um, contribute to the effects that had been ascribed to inactivity? Um, and for those of you who, uh, who again are of my vintage, um, that photo on the right is what we used to call a state-of-the-art standing desk. Um, literally, if you wanted a standing desk, that was it. There were no other alternatives. So uh, this was Brooke Stevens, now Hassan, um, uh, her uh, PhD work. And what she did, uh, she took 14 young men and women, uh, reasonably insulin sensitive, not athletes, not, um, not insulin resistant, um, and studied them in three conditions for 15 hours at a time. And in one condition, uh, we fed them, um, calculated based on their um, metabolic needs, about 3,100 calories a day. Uh, they expended about the same amount of energy, um, which kept them in approximate energy balance. And in that condition, there was no exercise per se, just a lot of activity, which I will describe to you. They stood, they walked around, they did stuff in the lab, they never exercised, they never did anything that was, um, that really got their uh, heart rate elevated, but they were active, or I should say not inactive, um, for the great majority of the day. In a second condition, they did nothing but sit for that entire 15 hours. Um, and I'll talk to you about that. Uh, they, again, we kept the energy intake the same. Uh, in this case, their energy expenditure was much lower because they were doing nothing but really sitting. Um, so that they ended up in an energy surplus of about 900 plus calories a day. In a third condition, um, we again had them sitting all day about the same amount of low energy expenditure but we cut back their energy intake to put them back in energy balance, just energy balance at a much lower level. So we have a condition when they're active in energy balance, inactive in energy surplus, and then inactive in energy balance with the idea that we can um, account for the energy surplus um, and really ascribe um, what portion of any effect we see is really the inactivity and what portion is due to an accompanying energy surplus. Uh, so uh, these figures uh, sort of show what they did. Uh, the purple is sleeping. We had to keep them in the lab. We turned um, part of the lab into what we called the penthouse, even though it was in the basement, because we couldn't let them go home and then either play basketball or, or do something that was going to ruin um, our very carefully calibrated low energy or high energy conditions. So we actually kept them overnight in the lab, 14 people, three conditions. So uh, Brooke and uh, her sidekick, uh, Kirsten, got to sleep in the lab for 42 nights, which I think they still hold against me, um, especially since I spent exactly zero. Um, and then the green shows how much time they were actually stepping and walking, um, which you can see is basically nothing in the inactive conditions. Standing, which comprised a lot of the uh, active condition, but none of the inactive in uh, either of the inactive conditions, and then sitting. Um, which was only about 20% of their time in the active condition and 70% of their time in the inactive conditions. Um, we even you know, took them in a wheelchair uh, to the bathroom in the inactive conditions to minimize the amount of movement that they had. Um, the great thing is that you know, in order to keep the active people active, but without exercising, we had to come up with tasks for them to do. And one of them was uh, reorganizing all the books in the lab, cleaning out the refrigerator. Um, so not only was this a kind of a cool study, but the lab was never cleaner um, than it was during this uh, few months that we were doing the study. And, and what we found, again, using that same technique of uh, continuous infusion of glucose with stable isotope tracers. So um, uh, the uptake per unit insulin on the, on the y-axis, higher numbers are better, lower numbers are worse. Um, uh, show you in the active condition, um, they were 
you know, the units aren't going to mean a lot. You know, somewhere around 0.37 uh, uh, micromoles per minute per kilogram per unit of insulin. Um, the, the interesting thing is that in the inactive condition where we kept their energy intake the same, uh, they were 39% lower in terms of insulin sensitivity in just one day. This is the next morning. Um, and about half of that um, was restored if we cut back the calories. So about half of the, um, and remember, this is a short-term study, uh, about half of the diminution in uh, insulin sensitivity uh, seemed to be due to uh, the, inner, the inactivity itself and about half to an accompanying energy savings. So just like we saw with exercise, uh, there is a, a confounding effect um, of energy surplus similar to what we saw with an energy deficit. So just to, again, complicate this a little bit, um, now we've added inactivity um, and the interactions with um, diet uh, to this graphic. Sorry, I know this is dated, but it just still makes me laugh every time I see it. Um, so I did tell you I was gonna come back to Ambien. Um, and in this case, uh, you, you may or may not remember, that in 2013, uh, the FDA actually changed uh, the recommended ambient dosage. Um, instead of being 10 milligrams for men and for women, um, it was uh, reduced to five milligrams for women. And that's because driving simulation studies found that um, anyone with more than 50 nanograms per mil of ambient in their blood had increased risk of a driving accident. There were a lot of driving accidents involving ambient and weirdly, a lot of them seemed to involve women. Um, and that's because, as it turns out, uh, when uh, in this study, uh, when 250 men and 250 women taking 10 milligrams of Ambien, that eight hours post-dose, about 15% of women and only 3% of men still exceeded that rate, that uh, level of 50 milligrams, nanograms per milliliter. So women metabolize Ambien differently uh, than men do. Um, and it made a difference, and it really probably contributed to a lot of these driving accidents that were happening uh, predominantly uh, to women. So we had an interest um, for a long time in, you know, the way hormones um, regulated um, substrate utilization or fuel utilization during exercise. Uh, and this was a study that uh, Tara Dion did when she was in the lab. Uh, she had a big interest in this. Um, and, you know, people had used the menstrual cycle as a way to try and understand how estrogen and progesterone uh, modulated. I think I'm again using it right. Um, the, um, the use of fat, carbohydrate, and blood, or glycogen and, and blood glucose during exercise. Um, but the menstrual cycle is a you know, pretty crummy uh, model for, uh, for uh, how estrogen and progesterone um, work because it is uh, unpredictable, irregular. Um, you know, that beautiful figure that's shown in every endocrinology book um, really describes exactly zero women in the real world. Uh, so working with um, a reproductive endocrinologist, um, we used a, a pharmacologic agent, uh, a gonadotrophin-releasing hormone antagonist uh, called Ganarelix, uh, to basically turn off estrogen and progesterone production temporarily um, in young, healthy women, and then add it back with transdermal estrogen or with oral progesterone. And then we measured um, blood glucose, glycogen, and fat utilization during exercise um, in these three conditions. On the left is the baseline, um, in the middle is estrogen only, and on the right is estrogen plus progesterone. And it really mattered, um, you know, that even though blood glucose shown in the white was about the same, um, in the estrogen condition, there was, there's a lot more use of fat and a much, uh, a much lower use of glycogen. Uh, and when you add back progesterone, you reverse that. You reverse that right back to baseline. So estrogen really drives um, substrate use in the direction of more fat use. Progesterone opposes that um, and does the opposite. And you might say, this is interesting. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, among a small group of people, what does this really have to do with, with health or with real health outcomes? So uh, very recently, in fact, my last doctoral student, Rich Piscacho, uh, did this work, a training study in women who were breast cancer survivors, uh, 15 women, a uh, three-month training study uh, four days a week, all of it supervised, all of it um, progressive um, uh, cardiovascular training um, and in people who are not already trained, all people who had had breast cancer and um, what were done with their acute treatment um, and uh, looked at 
blood glucose and insulin um, in response to a glucose tolerance test. Um, and on the, in the upper left panel shows the insulin secretion before and after exercise. Um, or three, not just three months of training, uh, very little difference, um, which was really surprised us. Usually the insulin is significantly lower. Um, if you look at the insulin area under the curve, um, on the right top, no difference. Uh, peak insulin, no difference. Um, and the continuous, in, uh, sorry, um, composite insulin sensitivity index, a mathematical way to express both the glucose and insulin at the same time, no difference. But if you uh, look at um, the women uh, of these 15 women, um, eight of them were not, sorry, eight, six of them were taking an aromatase inhibitor, which is a common medication used in women who've had breast cancer that is estrogen sensitive, and it lowers estrogen concentrations almost to zero. Um, and women take this um, for years and years after, uh, after breast cancer. Um, and six of the women were taking um, an aromatase inhibitor, eight of the women were not. I don't remember what, why the 15th person was not on there. And the story is completely different. Um, now I'm showing you basically the same data, but you can see that um, on the left uh, in the black bars, the women not taking the aromatase inhibitor had great changes, everything we'd expect. The insulin is lower, the insulin area into the curve is lower, the composite insulin sensitivity index is higher, which is good. Um, the change in two hour insulin um, is considerably um, changed. Whereas on the women, when the women who were taking the aromatase inhibitors, um, there were actually no beneficial changes. And in fact, it looked like they went the opposite direction. So the fact of taking an aromatase inhibitor or not vastly changed the interpretation um, of these data. And this is not um, a one-off. Um, there's actually uh, more and more data coming from cardiovascular studies, bone studies, uh, metabolism studies, um, showing that you know, estrogen really has a permissive effect on the effects of exercise. And without estrogen on board, exercise does not work nearly as well. There's no reason for this, except that I thought it was really cool. Um, a lot of the work we did involves type, uh, type two diabetes and prediabetes. And um, I know that there's a lot of um, uh, numbers that people throw around. So let me just try and put it in perspective. Uh, because it's hard to sometimes gauge what these numbers mean, that there are about 1.25 million people in the US with um, type one diabetes, which is about the same as the number of women named Linda. Um, there are about 29 or 30 million people with type two diabetes, which is about the same as the number of left-handed people in the US and somewhere around 79 or 80 million people with prediabetes. And if you take the Lindas and add them to the left-handed people and add that to everyone who's Jewish and everyone who owns a dog, that's the amount of number of people who have prediabetes. So hopefully now it's completely clear to you what these numbers mean. Um, and this is, you know, a very classic uh, piece of data from the Diabetes Prevention Program published in 2002. Uh, big multi-center trial, uh, 3,000 participants across 12 different clinical sites, um, looking at people who started off at high risk for diabetes and following them for four years. Um, in, uh, in one case, in a placebo condition, one case when they got the anti-diabetes drug metformin, um, and one case where they were given a lifestyle um, prescription that involved a low-fat, low-calorie diet and 150 minutes of exercise a week. And the data are shown on the left as cumulative incidence of diabetes. So the numbers keep increasing. They just keep adding cases um, as people make that transition from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Um, and it was almost 40% in the placebo group. So that is shows that this really was a high risk group, decreased by about 30% with metformin, and then, you know, yay us, decreased by almost 60% in the lifestyle group. And, you know, we looked at these data um, and, you know, I think had a, you know, what I would call a leap of insight, but I think any eight-year-old probably had this same leap of insight and thought, hey, metformin's really good and lifestyle's really good. And we know that metformin works primarily in the liver on fasting blood sugar. And we know that lifestyle primarily works in the muscle um, on postprandial glucose. What if we put them together? You know, would one plus one equal two? Um, and you know, not knowing any pharmacologists at the time, um, we thought this was reasonable. Now that I've met you know, more pharmacologists, they of course scoff and say that you know, in the world of pharmacology, one plus one can equal anything. <laughs> 
Um, but the least thing, but the least likely outcome is that it equals two. Uh, so we did an acute study, which I will only talk about briefly, looking at how a single bout of exercise would function in people who were taking metformin. And so we had uh, two groups, um, a group taking metformin and a group taking placebo. Um, we did this, uh, titrated them up for eight weeks until we got them to a full stable dose. Um, and then we studied the metformin people in three conditions before they take taken the metformin, after eight weeks on the metformin and in a resting condition, and then after eight weeks on the metformin in an exercise condition. Of course, you know, counterbalance those last two. And then the placebo group, um, in a, in the post-placebo in both a resting and a post-exercise condition. Uh, we took muscle biopsies. Uh, in this case, we did a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp um, and also you know, worked with uh, Lori Goodyear in her lab to do a, uh, analyses of a lot of intracellular mediators of insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. And uh, what we found, um, and this is uh, out data from the glucose clamp, similar to the other techniques I've shown you, it's glucose uptake per unit insulin, so higher numbers are better. Uh, in the placebo condition, um, the uh, single bout of exercise really helped, um, helped a lot. Um, to increase glucose uptake by about 25 or 30%, like always. But in the metformin condition, it did not. There was really no change uh, with exercise in the metformin condition. But those of you who are um, paying any attention at all um, will notice that there seems to be a baseline issue, uh, that the baseline um, in the placebo condition uh, is considerably different than in the metformin condition. Uh, yes. Um, and all I can tell you is that we matched them on every conceivable thing you could think of, and yet they were still, um, was this difference in, uh, in their baselines, which to this day, I still cannot explain. But fortunately, um, we had other pieces of data to kind of back that up. Um, this is um, uh, AMPK alpha-2, a major regulator of glucose uptake, showing that big increase in the placebo condition, that increase was blunted considerably in the metformin condition, um, luckily, we have you know, 10 other uh, outcomes that all reflect um, this idea that insulin sensitivity was greatly increased with exercise, was not really increased with exercise and metformin. Hepatic insulin sensitivity, same thing. AMPK activation, same thing. Glycogen use um, actually was the same in both conditions. So that, that was not the reason uh, that metformin is blunting um, the effect of exercise. But clearly, there was a blunting effect of, extra, of um, metformin um, on exercise, on the benefits uh, expected from exercise. Secondarily, um, Steve Mallon decided to do this, but do it as a training study, an eight-week training study, 32 men and women with impaired glucose tolerance. Um, so four conditions, a, or four groups, actually, a placebo control, metformin only, and then training with or without metformin. Again, eight weeks, no, sorry, 12 weeks of training, um, four times a week, all of it supervised. Uh, and then again, measured insulin sensitivity with glucose um, clamp and these isotopic tracers um, and found um, something very similar to what we found with the acute exercise. So again, same um, uh, outcome or same uh, units on the y-axis, placebo, metformin. Uh, metformin was effective to increase uh, glucose uptake, as you'd expect. Exercise and placebo even better. And exercise in metformin, not even as good as metformin alone. So again, we found that metformin blunted the effect of exercise on, um, on these outcomes. I'm gonna skip that, um, and I'm gonna skip that. So what we found, or what, you know, as we keep making this web more complicated, is that not only are there interactions between exercise, exercise training, um, hormones, and food intake, and timing of food intake, but there's also a big interaction with common, common pharmacologic medications. And pe other people have verified this. This is one where our finding that metformin blunts the effect of exercise has now been recapitulated a lot of times. Um, it's really heartening to see that it seems like we got that one right. So what are the take home messages here in terms of context? Um, one is I think that without accounting for the nutritional, the hormonal, um, and the uh, pharmacologic context um, that, and you could argue sleep and circadian biology and a whole lot of other things, that's the reason we get so many uh, outcomes that look like this. Uh, 
those of you who are exercise science uh, kinesiology folks have seen graphs that look like this a lot. This is what always happens. We take a number of people, we put them on exactly the same intervention, and some of them get a lot better, and some of them don't get a lot better, and some of them actually get worse. And we say, oh, you know, human variability, what are you going to do? But a lot of it, or some of it at least, can probably be explained by not correctly and rigorously accounting for context. Um, second, you know, accounting for the context is critical to designing strong studies. But you know, the downside is it does dilute generalizability. The more we control confounding variables, the more precise the answers, but actually the less uh, sort of ecological in terms of being able to generalize uh, to a free living situation. And we tried to, uh, to do this in a way that I think was not really satisfying to anyone. Um, with Jen Blankenship's PhD, we tried to do a combination of a laboratory and free living study that we called an echolabical approach, um, where we had free living people measured all the outcomes with continuous glucose monitors, but fed them their meals at precise times and in precise amounts to try and account for that uh, major confounding variable. It certainly helped, um, we got less variability, but again, you know, by giving people precise uh, meals at precise times, we are reducing the overall generalizability. Um, and then finally, you know, getting back to that idea of exercise as medicine, um, you know, at the moment, um, we have the idea of exercise as medicine with many, 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 many targets. Um, many of these diseases or conditions do not share etiology or pathophysiology at all, and yet our recommendations are pretty much the same for each of those conditions. Um, and then we haven't even accounted for all these other things, which clearly are going to um, matter as well. So I think, you know, in my mind, you know, one of the ways to start thinking about this, or at least attacking this uh, in a logical way, is to start thinking about exercise as medicine in three ways. In what cases are we thinking of it primarily as prevention? In what cases are we thinking of it primarily as therapy? And in what cases are we thinking of it primarily as medication? Because for prevention, you don't really need a precise dose response. A rough dose response um, is really what we need. Um, and then compliance, 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 compliance. Whereas if you're trying to use exercise as a medication, um, especially for something like diabetes, where you could potentially make somebody hypoglycemic, with too much exercise and insulin, um, the dose response really matters and the side effects really matter. So um, I'll just leave it there that I think that, you know, the next step, I, I hope, in terms of using exercise as medicine is to start to become, um, and I'm not obviously not the only one to think this, a lot more sophisticated about how we apply it. And I'll stop there um, with, you know, my, my favorite example um, of context. Thank you. Gosh, as anticipated, Barry, that was fantastic. Um, if the audience was half as appreciative as I was of that seminar, I think you succeeded uh, quite well, including validating my um, my own serving size of work. <laughs> so I sincerely appreciate that. I realized at the beginning of this, when I was giving instructions, I misspoke um, saying chat function. I really meant the Q&A function. So if you have questions for Dr. Braun, I really encourage you to pop those in right now. Um, one of the things I did want to ask you, though, uh, Barry, is this the idea that uh, I find myself being guilty of labeling individuals or even populations as saying, oh, they're insulin sensitive versus insulin resistant. And it's clearly relative to the time at which we make that measurement, right? For example, should that individual had walked up several flights of stairs, they might look a little different than if they had watched, you know, been binge watched Game of Thrones. To, to fall back to your, your presentation. And the same kind of comment goes for energy balance. It's all relative, right? In the context of when do we start the clock? When someone is actively exercising, are they, are they currently in negative energy balance? Is the only time we're in positive energy balance the moment that we're eating? So I'm just curious how you feel about those topics and what your comment might be, particularly in the first one, when we tend to say a population or an individual is X. Yeah, no, they're great points, and I, you know, wholeheartedly agree that, um, you know, that insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity are a continuum, um, and you know, we, we refer to people as insulin resistant or insulin sensitive rather than um, along this very, very wide 
continuum. And as you said, you know, you can game the system. If I, you know, was going to take a glucose tolerance test and I wanted to make sure that I was not going to be labeled diabetic, yeah, I wouldn't eat in the morning and I would go out and do a 10 mile run before I got there. Um, so you can absolutely, you know, change your insulin sensitivity throughout the day. We know it's different in the morning than it is in the afternoon. We know it's different after certain kinds of meals. So um, we know there's a circadian biology piece to this. So, yeah, and, and energy balance is the same thing. You're not, there is no, we, we do 24 hour energy balance because we're creatures of 24 hours, but I don't think the cells are really measuring energy balance on a 24 hour clock. Sure, absolutely. And I guess when you, when you think about it, the, you know, thinking that we have a diverse audience in the room, which is great, you know, not everyone in here works in my lab or uh, is, is in kinesiology even mm -hmm. is, so what is, what is the, the, the translational take home message for individuals that are seeking advice regarding the beneficial effects of, of exercise? How do you, how do you put that into context for those folks who are looking for even a reason to be physically active? You know, it, it, it's a great question and, you know, and I hate to go back to, you know, what the sort of dogma, but, you know, it is true that, you know, the biggest benefits are accrued in going from almost no exercise to some exercise, that there is a dose response so that those benefits, regardless of whether you have breast cancer or whether you're trying to prevent diabetes or whether you're trying to um, reduce your anxiety, um, there's clearly a dose response, but there's also, you know, diminishing returns. Once you get above a few hours of exercise a week, you're not really getting, you know, doubling the, the benefit anymore. So a little is good and a lot is, you know, somewhat better, but, you know, an enormous amount, probably not that much better or maybe even worse. It sounds so uh, stereotypical, but it's also true. Um, and then, you know, people say, well, you know, what's the best kind of exercise? Well, it's the kind that you enjoy doing and that you'll actually do regularly. Again, it's a cliche, but also true. Um, and a lot of the sophisticated, um, how do you tune the exercise strategy to the precise problem? Um, you know, I think for most people, that that's, should not be their problem. In the same way that, you know, what dose they should be prescribed by their physician for their gallbladder issues is not really their problem. It's really their physician's problem. So in a lot of ways, I'm, you know, trying to target this to, the healthcare providers, not the healthcare consumers. Yeah, and so uh, we've we've got a we've got a great question that falls in line with some of your ability to parse out the the components of what contributes to, to a, a beneficial metabolic effect. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Dr. Marette Traber asking, or at least first pointing out that caloric restriction has been used in animal studies uh, to prolong life, and she says she's always wondered. Uh, caloric restriction versus increased exercise, i.e. increased caloric requirement, does exercise increase lifespan? Um, hi, Dr. Traber. <laughs> um, it's a, and the answer is probably no. I mean, it really seems from, you know, studies in mice, rats, primates, and people that exercise, unlike caloric restriction, does not really increase lifespan. It does increase health span, the number of years you spend, you know, healthy and free of disease, but uh, I've never seen anything um, that clearly shows um, that exercise increases lifespan. Um, you could argue it makes your life better, but not longer. Um, and I, 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 I don't know if you want to comment on that as well. So you've probably seen this literature as well. You're, you're our, our honored guest. And I, I recognize the time. So I'm going to squeak in. You got one more question as well as one fantastic compliment. Um, so the question is, given the many potential interacting factors governing the effects of exercise, how do you propose we prioritize the study of these factors? That is a great question. And that's where, you know, in terms of an organizing principle, you know, I think of those three buckets of, you know, are we trying to think of exercise in this context as prevention? Are we trying to think of it as therapy? Or are we trying to think of it as medicine? Because I think that the prioritization tracks those those buckets you know and again as i said in one case i think really knowing the dose response i mean if you have somebody with type 1 diabetes um, and they take their insulin and then they exercise they can die <laughs> so you know the dose response becomes really important in terms of how much do you titrate their insulin dosage to the fact that they're exercising 
But if you're trying to have somebody who's trying to, you know, prevent or at least minimize their risk for cardiovascular disease or diabetes, I don't know if the dose response really matters as much as the least effective dose. And how do you, you know, maximize compliance? Yeah. Oh, I love that perspective. Well, with that, um, given the time, it is it is 2.01. I do want to welcome, if there's any folks that have any additional questions, you're more than welcome to stick around. Dr. Braun has agreed to stay around, in particular for any graduate students who would like to interact uh, with Dr. Braun. We've got a process for doing that. Um, so if you would like to stick around, you're more than welcome to do so. Please just hang out and we'll We'll change some of our, our functions here in just a moment. Uh, but beyond that, I want to say, while we still have most folks here, thank you so much, Dr. Barry Braun, for uh, presenting today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Marie Harvey for allowing me to do the introduction in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences for really sponsoring the entire event.